Hey, everybody. Welcome, welcome. I am checking to make sure that my live stream is working because it's acting funny. There we go. Okay, good. <clears throat> you know, it's always something technical around here. Um, let's see. Welcome to tonight's Hump Day Hanger presentation brought to you by supercup.org and the Not So Straight and Level podcast. So next week, there is no program because it's St. Patrick's Day, and I know you will all be out drinking green beer and uh, wearing green beads and, uh, and playing with leprechauns. So uh, next week, no, and that's really not the reason there's no program next week, but we're using that as the excuse. So um, the following week, we're actually scheduled to have Kevin Quinn on the program uh, of uh, Flying Cowboys and Stole Drag stole drag fame. Uh, he's up in Alaska right now, uh, finishing up some uh, work in the heli ski business. And so he's told us that he might be, might or might not be a hundred percent for doing the presentation next week. So just be advised that uh, we hope that we hope to see Kevin next week, but we're not a hundred percent sure he can be there. Um, but so stay tuned for that. Um, he meets in two weeks. I do. I mean, in two nothing. weeks, not next week. Thank you. Yes, next week is nothing. Next week is uh, leprechauns and green beer. And uh, th uh, the following week is uh, Kevin Quinn. And then we've got some other folks coming in after that, which I think you're going to enjoy. You can get all of that schedule if you go to the supercub.org homepage, click on the camels at the top, and it'll tell you about uh, all the programs that we've got that are coming up for the Hump Day show. So tonight's presenter is Mark Scott. And Mark is an aeronautical engineer with degrees from Worcester Polytechnic Institute, the University of Maryland and MIT. He retired from Sikorsky Aircraft in early 2020 and now works as a contract engineer for the Army. His certifications and flight experience include private pilot, single engine land, single engine sea. Additional training includes complex high performance spin tailwheel and aerobatics and he has 20 hours of helicopter flight time. He completed construction of his Bearhawk in 2014 and is half owner of an RV7A. Mark flew his Bearhawk to Alaska in 2015 and to the Big Tires and Campfires trip in 2017. Mark's the current president of the EAA Chapter 27 in Meriden, Connecticut, which is Laura's old EAA chapter. Uh, Mark initiated the Teens to Flight program where high school kids built an RV12 under the mentorship of chapter members. The aircraft flew in May of 2020 and is now used as a club aircraft separate from the chapter. Welcome, Mark Scott. Hey, great, thanks. So let's make sure I can get this uh, set up here. So share screen and sound and optimize are there. Share. And bring this up. There you got it. Looks hey, great. it's working. Wonderful. And I'm going to swap. Beautiful. <clears throat> great. Well, thanks, Steve. Thanks, Laura, for having me. Um, thanks, everybody, for uh, joining us. Um, something a little different, more about building and working with kids, uh, but uh, something that uh, we have found very uh, enjoyable and very fulfilling. And I uh, thought it'd be a, a good chance here to uh, share it with you and maybe get some interest and maybe you'll find a uh, uh, some enthusiasm to maybe do something similar. Um, so you heard a little bit of my bio there, and uh, I'm just an airplane person through and through. Um, the, 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 the real synopsis here is I built my airplane, and I had such a good time doing it. I wanted to build another one, but I didn't want to do it by myself. And I said, well, maybe I should get some other people to help me. And I thought the best way to do it would be to get some kids involved. And that's kind of what got me going on this whole thing. And the chapter just kind of rolled in, and uh, it just worked out really well. So I'm gonna tell you about the program and kind of how we went about it and uh, what we learned from it and uh, kind of what the, we're doing with the airplane now. So uh, like Steve said, I'm the uh, president of chapter 27. Um, and this was a combination of efforts between uh, Wilcox Technical High School, which is right down the road from the airport. And then other high school kids got involved from other schools, our chapter, and then the airport itself in the city was very helpful. And uh, we'll talk about that. So first thing is, is why did we do this? And I gave you the kind of my personal reason, but um, chapter 27, we're, we're, all EA chapters kind of have their own personalities and some are into restoration, some are doing a lot of flying, some are a lot of building, maybe some vintage. Well, we're big into youth education and uh, it was kind of like that when I got there and it's only gotten bigger. 
we've flown over 2,700, probably up to 2,800 young eagles. And we fly them all one at a time, which is really cool because they all get to fly the airplane. They get personal attention. Um, in fact, in fact uh, one of our guys, Fran Uliana, was EAA um, Young Eagles Coordinator of the Year. I forget what year it was, 2005 or seven, something like that. Uh, we've taught aviation merit badge classes. We've done school tours. And uh, it just it, it's just a really good thing. And everybody in the chapter rallies around that. So we might kind of want to go to the next level. Well, what, what's the next step we could do? Uh, and there's some pictures of uh, building airplanes. And, like, like oil or turpentine? Or... Yes, and uh, just some pictures of kids uh, flying with uh, Rick Beebe here. So here's more why is the other reason I said, well, if we could you know, do something bigger and better, it's, a, it's also a great way to get membership more involved in building. I thought if we build an airplane, because we don't have as many builders as we used to, and I thought this would be a good way to get more exposure to the adults in the area about building an aircraft. So that's like a second benefit. And this is why we do it. And this is really self-explanatory. This is one of my favorite pictures. This is Joshua. And this is probably the happiest, brightest face kid I ever flew flying on Young Eagle flight. And uh, this is just the kind of feeling they get and uh, you know, it rubs off on everybody around us. Hey, Mark. Yeah. Your screen has not changed. Your, your slides are not progressing. They're we're just not seeing progressing. The e, we're just seeing the EAA chapter. Okay. Did you me, share the PowerPoint or did you share the screen? I shared the PowerPoint, I thought. Hmm. What, what do you see now? Just RV-12 build program, that first, first screen. <sighs> okay. Um, your screen sharing is paused. Why would that be paused? Uh, I don't know, but unpause it. Let's see if that fixes it. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing and reshare. Let's try right. that. All right. Share program share button. What do you see now? We see that. Now let's see if when you go backwards and forwards, it works. Okay. So if I do, oops. Okay. Do you see now people leaning over an airplane? Uh, we do. Ah, uh, okay. All right. So uh, you didn't miss much. Okay. So pictures of kids flying paper airplanes. Um, pictures of guys and uh, students looking over the, the fuselage of RV-12. Like I said, we're trying to get members, uh, uh, EA chapter members involved. And then this one you need to look at. This is Joshua with his bright, happy face. And this is why we do it. This is why we do the youth stuff because it's so rewarding. And this is the fun why. <clears throat> so we built the RV-12 and it was just a, the, the airport and uh, people heard about this thing and said, well, we should have an airport celebration day. And I said, that sounds like a great day. And so we just have a new hangar. So we'll talk about that in a second. And they, the city got the press there. They got the, the newspaper, they got the TV. And uh, it was just like a, a great little festival. And it was just a, one of these unforget, unforgettable recognitions for everybody involved. This is one of our students, Jaden, and he got to talk on camera and was on news that night about building an airplane. And so everybody just ate it up. And uh, that was just really good because it, it made all the kids feel like they'd done something really special. I mean, to get that kind of recognition for showing up for three years and then seeing their, uh, their airplane in the paper, uh, in the Merit and Record Journal, um, you know, it's just something they're always gonna, gonna take away with them. So that's kind of the, the fun why and the, the good why. And then there's some favorable spillover. Uh, this is in Bridgeport, Connecticut. And they heard about our program. And this uh, guy gave me a call and said, we want to do this at our high school. I said, great, here's what you, here's what you got to do. And he was already well on his way. And they had a kickoff event. And they actually had the lieutenant governor, second, you know, second to the governor there at the airport. And she thought it was a wonderful thing, it was in particular asking how many girls were going to be there. And we said, as many as want to come. And so now they're building the same airplane down at uh, Bridgeport Airport. And then up in Hartford, <clears throat> chapter 166 got a hold of a kit. And now they're building one too. And so we flew the RV-12 up there and talked to them about how we're doing it. And we're talking to them now and then. And they're, they're getting along. They're probably maybe 30, 40% of the way there now. So there's been all kinds of good spillover from having this project going on. And then there's the hidden why, is that I've been, part of my uh, hidden agenda has been that telling everybody and making sure that our chapter does everything we can to make the airport a better place. Because if we do that, good things will happen for us. So we do 
airport cleanups. We help repair things. We've painted the inside of the FBO. And then we do all these things for the kids and we make the paper and we do this flight project. Well, in 2020, we got all these brand new hangars at the airport. Um, the airport, you know, put out a bond and they went through this whole thing, but we had to have a lot of support from the, the purchasing agent, from the city, the town council. They all had to think the airport was a place worthy of putting some investment in. And it happened. And the airport's been in long need of this. So, you know, we've got renovated FBO going on this year, upgraded fuel pumps. So if anybody's thinking about doing something like this, remember it has spillover, not just to other chapters, but for your own airport. And Meriden's on a definite upswing. Um, and it's a, it's a really nice place to be right now. So this is our plan. So we're getting to kind of what we did is, is, is kind of broke it up into three sections here is that you have to have commitment. So the first thing I had to make sure was you had chapter members wanted to help out and do that. And I was going to be supported. And then we had to make sure we had students, right? Nothing happens without that. And then we had to find a place to do it. And we had to get approval from the city of Meriden to do it at the airport. So that was like stage one, commitments and logistics. Second one is we're going to set up a nonprofit foundation as the owners of the aircraft. <clears throat> and then we can start raising money. And actually, if we were a 501c3, we can actually offer tax deductions to people, which uh, proved to be beneficial. And then we had to select an airplane project. And once we had that all done, <clears throat> set up the space, start building, and just go through the whole build process, which took about three years, you know, inspect it, flight test it. And then the plan is to sell the airplane. So for those who don't know, is an EA chapter cannot own a flying aircraft. It's just not within the insurance rules of EAA. And it's probably a good idea. And so the plane had to be sold, but the idea is take that money and fund the next project. And then do the loop, you know, find a next group of enthusiastic students and EA chapter members, and then go back to the same place and try again. So the plane's been sold and we've sitting on some money here. And we're trying to figure out what to do next. So starting down that path is here's that commitment group. <clears throat> so I found four members in the chapter that were particularly enthusiastic for doing it. And we had, let's see, one, two, three, we got four students here that were the first students to uh, start off. And I said, that's enough, we can go from here. So off we went. So this is, this is basically day one of starting this project. Um, <clears throat> so we did it at Meriden. Uh, again, a nice airport, not very big. We have a, an office building uh, on the left here. I'm hoping you can see my cursor. They have a garage building for a snow plow, like a big back end, a front end loader here, fuel pumps are in the front. And we got this spot just on the right. It's kind of an extra spot in this hangar and it's heated, which is just wonderful. And they said, yeah, you could use that. We said, thank you very much. This is gonna work out great. <clears throat> So the financial plan was uh, fund the project as we go. And RV-12 is you can buy in kits, uh, various, uh, I think it's five or six kits. And they're all very well put together. Um, and that way we could raise enough money, buy the kit, build it, raise money as we go building the kit and buy successive kits. Um, so we did the 501c3 thing, which is quite a long um, application, but it, uh, it worked out pretty well. And we said there's going to be no, no fee for student participation. However, donations would be appreciated, and we wanted the students to help out raising money. We'll talk about that in a minute. So basically, that's the loop here. All right, start up donations, buy the plane, and just uh, keep on going, sell the plane, and eventually use that money to fund the next project. So we had, did have to pick a, an aircraft. Uh, there are other aircraft builds around the area, but RV-12 was the most popular. And I looked into all these, you know, the regular RVs, uh, the Zeniths, um, Sonics, and the RV-12 was really coming out to be number one for a number of reasons. First off, it had really good plans. Um, and this is really important for a project because we have kids coming and going. We have adults coming and going either, you know, week to week or generally maybe over the course of months. And so you have to be able to pick up where other people left off. So it works like a nice checklist system. They're very well illustrated, and it gives students, a, you know, a chance to read plans, which you know, hopefully they may be doing in the future for their jobs. Of course, Vans has good factory support. It was all pull or squeeze rivets, um, so there's no rivet gun. Uh, so that's that's really good one for noise, and two, it takes some skill to do good, consistent riveting. Um, a lot of prefab parts, so they didn't have to have a lot of uh, good uh, workmanship skills for uh, cutting and grinding or what have you. Almost all metal, basically all metal and fiberglass. And then the resale value is very good. So we knew we'd want to sell this airplane. 
and we had wanted to get back at least what we put into it. And the RV12 was one of the few that you can sell it for what you put into it in terms of money. And that was good because we knew we'd have to sell it in the future. <clears throat> so we made all these decisions and plans and so forth. And in the uh, early 2015, I was just starting to pull this whole thing together. An announcement comes out from EAA that they're going to build five sets of wings at Oshkosh. They're gonna have people come by and build it, you know, put, pull the rivets in these wings. And at the end of the week, they're gonna give these wings away to various chapters have them finish the airplanes and hopefully put them into a flying club. Well, I just jumped all over that because I saw one of the sets of wing was, wings was going to be an RV-12. And I said, I want those wings. And uh, we put together an application and we won. And this is a picture of uh, both wings checked off being built. And uh, uh, we got them for free, which was really nice. So it saved us like $6,000. <laughs> and I guess they were kind of proud of them. Uh, they had a picnic after Oshkosh. They had like a big thank you picnic and they pulled the wings out and they stuck them right in the middle of their picnic area. And those are our wings. And if you look carefully, there's all these signatures on the wing right here. Those are all signatures of people. They pulled a few rivets, they're able to sign the wing. And so when we got these, they, they were all signed. And in fact, they're still on there today because we haven't painted the airplane yet. And in fact, Dick Van Grunsen signed it. That's his signature on the lower right wing. So we think we're gonna mask that off and not paint it. So we have a, a signature version of the RV-12. So <clears throat> the money aspect, well, we had to raise money to do this. So uh, first off, there were a lot of people that uh, contributed. This was a thank you chart I used at one of our meetings. And we gave some special recognitions to large financial donors. And these are some of the people that contributed. So we had people that contributed $100 plus. We had some people in the $200 plus neighborhood. We had some other people in the $500 to $1,000 neighborhood. Um, we were able to get a $3,000 grant from Sikorsky Aircraft, uh, which was nice. Um, and then we had some big donations. We had one from a, a woman named Dorothy Valley, who is a chapter member, and she was a she is a retired uh, Northwestern Airlines pilot, and really enjoys supporting uh, kids in aviation. And she made a $200 donation in 2019, and said she would match contributions from other chapter members, which is very generous. Um, ended up being $1,370 uh, in challenge donations. So she ended up donating over $1,500 to, uh, to the effort. I don't think she was expecting quite that much, but she honored it to her credit. And one of the reasons is this guy, Jim Freer. <clears throat> Jim was uh, living in a retirement community not too far away from the airport. And he somehow found out about us and he stopped by. He said, you guys are just doing wonderful stuff. And he stopped by every Sunday and chat with us and see how things are going. He donated $3,500 in the end. And so every now and then you get these really generous people that came by. So we gave them some rides. And uh, so uh, that was really nice. So we raised money where we could. <clears throat> we, uh, somebody donated a handmade uh, quilt and we raffled that off and made $1,200 on that. So that was uh, from a chapter member, chapter member's wife, I think actually. <clears throat> and then we did several plane washes and bake sales. Uh, this was really popular with owners. And I realized we did not charge enough. I think we charged $40. I think we could have charged 60 easy because the kids would get out there and they'd get all soaked up and dirty and they'd crawl under the airplane and get all that filth on the bottom. And we did this in the warm weather and ended up being really popular. And we raised like $1,000 every time we did this. So uh, that worked out pretty well. And got the kids got some, uh, got some skin in the game. <clears throat> and then this one, Excuse me. This was a this was a, a strange one. So, one of the kids in the uh, group, his name was Jaden. His father is the only licensed Michael Jackson impersonator, or, or whatever you want to call it, in 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 the world. And he puts on a show as Michael Jackson, and he's good. And he said, "I think you guys are doing great. I'll put on a benefit show for you guys." And he did. And uh, we raised over $7,500 with this show. Basically, his he he didn't take any money. We just paid for expenses, and we walked away with $7,500 in a local show. So that was uh, that was kind of neat. So, and then we got kind of lucky. Is that the, there was a flying club in the area, the Oxford Air Knockers, and they had an aircraft. And for various reasons, the club dissolved. And everybody kind of moved or walked away and we realized that th that club is going to dissolve and they actually donated the airplane to our chapter uh, for the 
for the uh, for and to be sold for the revenue for the RV12. Uh, and a very strange uh, blessing is the aircraft was actually blown over in a windstorm. We got full insurance value, and so I didn't have to go sell the airplane. <laughs> Just kind of good and bad. It saved me effort. Unfortunately, the plane was kind of nice. It was having some engine trouble. But uh, anyhow, so that pulled in 17.5. And so that helped quite a bit. So <clears throat> the rest was made up through small donations. And there were a number of loans uh, made from the chapter members. And uh, some of those loans are still outstanding, but are going to be paid off once, uh, since now that the airplane's being sold and the process of being sold to the uh, to the flying club. So this is where we built the airplane, chapter 27. Uh, anybody could show up uh, and come see what it was like. This is day one, uh, 20 by 26 foot space. We're kind of right next to this big loader you see on the left. That's Steve Frost. Uh, I remember saying, oh boy, I, I hope this is going to work both in terms of space and people and money and everything else. But hey, nothing ventured, nothing gained. And so we had to develop kind of a program, how we're going to do this with kids. So it was every Monday evening from six to nine. Uh, that's when the Civil Air Patrol was there and the building was open. We had to have the building open for facilities or if somebody had to you know, take care of a cut or something or what have you. And we'd always work one, one weekend. So we were not on the fast plan. We were on a plan that worked for people. Um, we always had to have at least two, two adults there, two instructors. And the rule was the students build the vast majority of the plane. So we had to make sure that the adults weren't building it, having the kids watch. It was the other way around. The kids are handling the tools and reading the plans, getting, getting the parts and all that stuff and, and doing it. And we had to kind of make sure we pulled ourselves back. Um, and it worked out pretty well. <clears throat> nice thing, but RV-12, hand tools, electric drill, pneumatic, rivet squeezer, rivet gun, all pretty simple stuff. All things the kids could handle pretty well. We had no toxic chemicals or fumes. Uh, any painting was done outside in warm weather. Safety glasses were always there. And we always had a first aid kit in the shop area. And part of, most of that reason for this guy right here in the black shirt, his name's Spencer. We ended up calling him Spencer the Fearless. I think he drilled his finger three times. He just had a trouble with drilling. <laughs> so his finger's OK. But uh, that's why you have a first aid kit in the, uh, in the shop. So we started with simple tool, uh, simple boxes from Vans. Vans tells you this box and you learn how to squeeze rivets and drill holes and stuff like that. And I thought it was pretty rudimentary, but I thought, well, let's try it. I was surprised at how poorly most of the kids were with simple tools. Yeah, I give a kid a file to deburr an edge and they really didn't even know which way to hold it. They didn't know which way to push it. They didn't understand about the teeth, you know, the angled teeth. Drilling a hole, you had to show them the reflection technique to keep it straight, you know, how to start a hole, how to dimple it. Um, there was some basic learning to do. Uh, things that I took for granted, uh, kind of had to backtrack and, and work with them, but it was fun. But it, it, they all learned pretty quick. And as soon as you start working with the metal after a little while, you just kind of become second nature. So clicoing, alignment, you start on the tail first, which is typical for RVs, start with something simple and uh, you're on your way. So, and then you start completing things and you start seeing some happy faces like these. Uh, we had a couple of girls go through the program, which was nice. Um, uh, all the rest were guys. All told, we had 24 students go through over the course of three years. Uh, some went off to college and things, so they didn't complete it. Some came in in the middle of the program. But uh, there's the, um, the vertical tail. This is Kernan. He is going to look older in subsequent pictures. He worked out, he did those trim tabs himself, so he was pretty proud of those. It's kind of fun. You, you can see them latch on to certain uh, things. You would find that kids would gravitate to a certain piece of the aircraft for one reason or another, be it a, a mechanical thing, electrical, landing gear, engine. It was kind of neat. And so if they came back, we would just go do that. You want to work on that? Go ahead. You know, go find a partner and work on that kind of thing. So they could take a little ownership and pride on something that was uh, was completed. And so fuselage, very shiny material. Kind of a fun picture. <clears throat> and there was a log book that was signed after every uh, every session. We had to keep a log. And uh, we wanted to keep track of the kids, keep track of the hours, keep track of the adults. And so they picked up a little discipline in doing that. <clears throat> Here's the lower fuselage. The lower fuselage has got a lot of parts in it, a lot of, a lot of subframes and flooring and some triangular parts. And Steve, uh, in particular, liked working on this. This is uh, Spencer again working on the crossbar here. So, um, you know, just uh, 
just kept on moving along. Like I say, sometimes they get excited. This part was particularly complicated in here. This is the horizontal tail spar, and it was a, a, a box beam with four parts. And she finally figured out how to put all those clecos in there, get that all put together. You can see the plans right here. You know, when in doubt, read the plans. And if you're still in doubt, read them again and read them again. And it's quite often we wouldn't tell them how to do things until they had read the plans. And they learned after a while, go read the plans first, then go ask for help. And uh, this is part of the learning process. So kind of a picture from the top, the fuselage is built in two halves. We have the forward fuselage, kind of looks like a canoe with a hoop on it. And then the aft fuselage here on the left. And you can see some of the wiring and the plumbing is starting to go in here. And it was kind of a big day when this thing uh, came together, it actually went together pretty quick. And stay organized. <clears throat> this is one thing that uh, I think the adults learn to appreciate more and the kids learn to appreciate is that when they ship this to you, it is just it is just boxes full of parts. They give you every nut and bolt and rivet and everything you can think of. And you have to inventory the whole thing uh, before you, when you get it to make sure you're not missing things. And they, they missed a couple things, but not much. And then the question is, well, how do we put this out? And we there were times where we spent a kid would spend most of an evening trying to find a certain bag. We said, well, we can't do that. So we came up with this inventory system where bags are put up on cardboard uh, you know, tall cardboard, pieces of cardboard and leaned up and labeled. And so this whole thing about staying organized, you know, was a time saver and also again, taught the kids that being organized, they could, you know, really see how that helps save time and make sure you get the right parts in the aircraft. So here, like I say, some nights were just all sorting and organizing. When a big box came in, they spent two hours just going through everything. Okay. And then this is our inside man. <laughs> this is uh, Roy Stout, so um, uh, AKA Gremlin. Um, so he worked at Wilcox Technical High School and he's the one that got me in to do the initial pitch to the kids to uh, drum up uh, support. I can't remember exactly how I got in touch with him, um, but he was our inside guy telling students as they came through his classes, his graphic arts classes, hey, these guys are building, building an airplane down the road. Would you wanna check it out? And we got a steady stream of students from him um, uh, from the school. So it uh, worked out well. His son was, was working in it and uh, he went through the whole program. So here's a picture of the fuselage together. This is kind of a neat picture. You can see this is kind of a full day. Um, the, the magic formula was to have two students to one adult. That, that generally worked out best. Um, if you had three students, you typically didn't need six hands on a part to make it happen. Four hands usually worked out pretty well, one adult to work with them. And so you'd pair up. So you could only have as, you know, two times as many students as you did adults. Uh, once in a while we got over that and that proved tricky. Um, but here you can see they're kind of, they're kind of paired up in stations and, and doing their thing. Once, <clears throat> once in a while, we have some we have some fun. Somebody came up with some big stuffed animals. We stuck them in there. Um, here we're putting on the, uh, the cowl, checking all the fit, and uh, again landing gear. So fortunately, as you can start working on a number of places in the aircraft at the same time. This is Kernan again. He seemed to do pretty well at fiberglassing. Uh, kind of made a mess, but there you have to do. You actually had to lay up this fiberglass. And so the kids actually learned how to, you know, mix the resin, put down the uh, put down the plies, have templates to decide where the plies go, and then the whole sanding exercise and trimming that goes with it, you know, the taping off and all that. So again, another another hands-on experience that they probably wouldn't get anyplace else. <clears throat> Engine went in. That was a kind of a big day. All the wiring. Um, this is Mike here. He in particular did did most of the wiring on the aircraft. I have other pictures of him. He happened to have small, narrow hands. So he was good in getting in there. And this is Dylan. He particularly liked working on the engine system and the installation of all that. So, so this is Dave here. This is my actually my partner on the RV7A, a little sidebar. Remember how I told you that was about getting other chapter members involved. Dave found out about the chapter, found out about the build, started showing up and he just showed up every day and now he's my partner on the RV7A. He said, I should have done this 20 years ago. And now he's looking to go buy another airplane. He wants to get a tail dragger. So he's uh, completely been consumed by this whole experimental aircraft thing, which is just, just great. This is one of my favorite pictures, probably three of my favorite kids. 
Um, this is uh, Tyler in the back here. This is Kernan, who was there just about the entire time. And this is Kylie, who came and went. But she was very busy with uh, robotics. Uh, she ran the girls' robotics program at her school. And so she'd get busy with that. And they got a lot out of this. And they're all going to engineering school uh, of some sort. I'll give you a quick story about Tyler here in the front page here, uh, front middle of the picture. So Tyler was uh, went to see his guidance counselor and said, you know, I want to you know, look at colleges and I want to look at something in a technical area. The guidance counselor says, great. What have, what have you done in the technical area? To, you know, that's, that's piqued your interest. And Tyler goes, well, I built an airplane. And the guidance counselor says, well, that's great. Model airplanes are a great way to, to learn about things. And Tyler goes, no, I built a real airplane. It took Tyler 10 minutes to convince his guidance counselor that he had built a real airplane. I think he brought a picture or something. So that leaves an impression on the guidance counselor. It leaves an impression with anybody he talks to and trying to get into a college or uh, frankly, any job he goes after is he can say, I built an airplane. And uh, that's one of the reasons we do this. So I'm actually Kern and uh, Kylie got benefit for the same reason. Working with fiberglass, Kern was really into detail. You can see him looking very carefully at trimming this up. And uh, he, was a, he was a good worker. This is uh, Spencer again. Uh, if we had to do painting, we'd do it outside. So we had to time some, some of this warmer weather painting and uh, uh, work doing outside, but uh, did what we had to. Read the plans, read the plans, All right? That's what they did. Plans got kind of beat up, but we still have them all. And uh, so really good education about, you know, communication and writing and how it's very important. It really makes it come alive for them and what it means to be clearly written. Working in the back with Kylie, some of the electrical connections on the uh, trim motor. Sometimes you get physically stuck. <laughs> this is Steve, he had to claw back there to, to get something. He really did get stuck. He sits, I think that's still in the back smiling quite a bit. Sometimes you get mentally stuck. Sometimes you just can't figure out how to program these things or the wiring. So there were times where we were just trying to figure this out, but the kids learned the, the, the process, the, uh, the diagnostic process to figure out why something's not working the way it should. And it all eventually led to this in November, 2018. We got the plane built, uh, did our first run up. Um, everything ran fine. Uh, it was a good day. Weight and balance uh, after that, after we made sure everything was running, we were able to borrow some scales, uh, came up pretty much where it was supposed to because we've made no modifications. The plane is built exactly the plan. So you should expect a weight that's uh, right where it should be. And then we had a certification nightmare, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, that, that there's a little bit of a lesson here is um, if you remember the 30, 737 MAX debacle, well, all of the FAA became very careful about everything and some even more so than others. And we started working with the FISDO up in the Bradley area. And the guy up there just was not comfortable or didn't know how, I'm not sure how to put it, how to deal with an airplane built by 24 kids and handful of adults and wings built by a bunch of people at Oshkosh. And then it's going to be at ELSA and all this stuff. And then who owns it and who's the manufacturer? And to make a long story short, we spent 12 months with the working with the FAA and didn't get anywhere. And finally, the DAR I'm working with, he, he left because of the difficulty. And he hooked me up with the DAR at the New York FISDO. And in less than six weeks from the first phone call, I had the registration certificate for the airplane. <laughs> so it really pays in the, to work with somebody uh, that kind of knows the airplane and knows how to work with the ELSA. So if anybody's in the building thing, kind of find out how the lay of the land in terms of uh, EAB aircraft, ELSA is in your area, find out the right uh, office to go to. So uh, anyhow, it worked out fine. So some build stats, I'll start to wrap stuff up here a little bit. Um, we started in September 15, finished in December of 18. Uh, again, we were on the uh, not on the fast plan. We didn't fly until 20 because of the debacle and the, and the certification. We had 24 students overall. Those are a huge number of hours. That is a lot of hours, over 5,500 man hours on this aircraft. If a single person basically knows what they're doing and is relatively handy and can read plans and has everything, you can build this airplane less than 1,000 hours. But remember, we had students that were learning as they went. You always had two students instead of one, and they had an adult looking over their shoulder. So it all adds up, but that's okay. That's, those are all learning hours for people involved. And that's kind of the whole point of the thing. 
And the whole thing was over $72,000, even with the free wings. So there's a lot of shipping and um, non-airplane stuff that uh, kind of rolled in there. So uh, anyhow, that's, that's, that's the bill. So with that, I'm going to run a quick video and then wrap up with two more charts and then I'll be taking uh, questions. So hopefully this comes through. Meriden Markham Municipal Airport. Automated weather observation 1312 Zulu. Wind calm. Visibility 10. Sky condition clear. Temperature 13 Celsius. Dew point minus 04 Celsius. Altimeter 3032. Dave, can you hear me? Yeah, Roger. Current traffic, RV, November 935, Whiskey Tango, Department Runway 18, Meriden. Good, passing 2300. Hey, good to hear. All right, so it's always fun to watch airplane videos. Oops, pass this. <clears throat> so, by the way, I, I, <clears throat> my uh, son actually is into video, uh, taking videos, and he put that uh, that together. And it, uh, it's really kind of special to have. <clears throat> so, um, so our current status. So, uh, the airplane I flew off the hours on the airplane. By the way, ELSA only needs five hours to fly off, as opposed to forty. So, it's a big advantage, and that's one reason we pushed for that. Uh, took us more than five hours, had to work out a couple little um, little bugs here and there, but uh, really nothing major. So uh, we started the Spirit of Meriden Flight Club in September of 2020. It's a 10 equity member club and it's hangered at Meriden Airport. So uh, we were able to find enough people to start it. Um, we've got six members right now. We're looking for four more. We've got two in the wings. I'm pretty sure going to join in the summer. So I'm actually running that as well. I wanted to make sure that that went well. So I'm the president running that now. And eventually I hope to hand it off to uh, a president and uh, let that go. So this is just a picture of our website. And so far, so good. It's going well. We've got 200 hours on the airplane. Hey, Mark. Yeah. We, we have a question. Sure. If you don't mind. Um, first, that was awesome. Um, and the question is, uh, approximately what would that plane sell for? 
I, we, you talked about what you had invested yeah. in, but if you went out to just sell it, what would that sell for? Um, before COVID hit, that plane was probably selling for 80, maybe 85,000. Of course, it's not painted. That's like a $5,000 hit, but a painted one would be in the mid eighties, you know, um, we have it priced at, uh, we think it's more like 75 now if it was painted and we give it a value of 65,000 as a sale value for, uh, unpainted. Thanks. Yeah. So I just got two more charts here and, uh, hopefully people are still there. I don't have any pictures of people watching. Um, so just a couple of lessons learned, two more. So the, as far as a project goes, the magic formula is two kids per adult seem to work well, stay organized. Um, they read the plans, read the plans, read the plans. That's, that's how this plane went together, went together correctly. And you will build the plane three times. I don't know how many builders are out there, but you typically put it together once, take it apart, fix what you had to do, put it together again. Uh, make sure you're happy with it. If you're not, it takes one more pass. And so the kids learned a lot about going back and forth and doing that. There's no rush. There was never a rush for any of these kids to get done. If it takes three years, then so be it. That's about the learning process. Um, I told you about tools. Don't assume someone knows how to, what to do or how to use a tool. And uh, a couple times early, I realized I had to make sure I demonstrated something just to be sure they knew how to pull a rivet or drill a hole or file something or, or even simple things like learning how to torque up a multiple bolt assembly. If you don't torque the first bolt all the way, you torque all them you know, in sequentially. And so it all seats nicely. You know, little things like that, you just don't learn unless you go do it. And uh, there have been a lot of service bulletins on this aircraft. I guess that's kind of a good thing and a bad thing. It's bad that it has them, but it's good that Van stays on top of it. So um, we're still doing that. And we were able to incorporate a lot of, uh, a lot of this into the, uh, into the airplane as it went on. So, and then the other thing is, is about building an airplane. It's an education. So I don't know how many of you out there are, are thinking about building an airplane or, or have talked to people thought about doing it, but it, it's an education in many ways. And of course there's all the metalworking, wiring, fiberglassing and painting, all those hands-on thing. And that's what people think about when they're building an airplane and maybe what the kids thought about. But then you become familiar with aircraft hardware, bolt sizes, types of tools, how tools work and stuff like that. So if you ever own a house or a car, hey, you've learned something about that. These kids may be more apt to be more involved in their, in their homes and their cars. Cost and performance value assessments. Well, we could we could have built our fuel tank, or we could have bought it. And we had to make a decision as a group. Do we do, do we save four hundred dollars and build it or do we just buy it, put it in? And we ended up buying it, putting it in for a variety of reasons. But we had to talk about the risks and the time and the money for doing that and the trade-offs. Rapid prototyping. Sometimes we'd have to make parts early. We'd, we'd make something out of aluminum, a scrap piece of aluminum, and see if we could make the, the drilling or learn how to drill a certain way or use a certain kind of uh, countersink tool. Safety assessments. We had to both in, in the working area and on the aircraft is, is what's going to be the most safest thing to do. Human factors. Kids would ask, why is this like this? Why is the instrument panel a certain way? Well, there are human factors things about visibility and what have you. Make by outsourcing decisions. Again, you could buy things where you could make them. We talk about them with, uh, talk about that. The cost and schedule. People ask me, how much does this cost? And then people would say, well, how long does it take to do things? And we'd have to decide, well, when are we going to finish this? And is that going to be in time for the guys working on the tail? And we've got to do the fiberglass painting when it gets warm outside. So let's put that off. So you learn how to schedule and manage the, the logistics of, of, of the airplane, which is logistics planning. Time management. You know, are we going to finish this in the next hour? Or should we not do this project and wait till we come back for the next three hour session on the weekend? So you learn how to manage your time. Uh, kids learn how to manage their time so they could come to the to, to the event, to the to the build session. So they had to manage their homework, manage their, you know, if they're on the swim team or something like that. We talk about financing. You know, we, the kids had, I had to tell them, you know, talk some money to build this airplane. You guys got to come and, and, you know, help out where you can. And they did. And so they learn a bit about the money aspect and then the risk management, both to themselves and building the aircraft and then test flying. And we talk about the test flying and stuff. And so that's an interesting list. But you know what's really important about that list? The students got exposure to all this stuff, not just the top line, but all this stuff. And it's all stuff they can apply to their job in the future. Every single of those lines. If you think about what you do at work, I bet you anything, you've got a majority of those things that you have to do as part of your job. Well, they got that. Uh, through this program and can't tell you how much, but I can tell you, I know they've benefited from it. So uh, 
that's one of the most important takeaways that I think they got from this and that and that we as a chapter got in giving it to them and also to the uh, to the adults that worked on it. So with that, I'm going to I'm going to stop here. Um, and thanks for your attention. I'm more than happy to take questions. And I had to throw a little picture of my bear hawk on the bottom there. <laughs> Hope to take it out and see uh, Laura and Steve the summer the summer with it. So um, I'll stop there. Well, thank you so much, Mark. That was really awesome. Um, just amazing. So did, was this your idea originally to do this? Um, yeah, yeah, it was me. Like I said, I was I was saying, well, I, I really like the chapter. Uh, let's see, I got I to stop screen sharing here, by the way. Oh, you did. I You're did? Good. Yep. Okay, I was going to hit OK. So yeah, I, I, I really enjoy our chapter. We've got a bunch of good people. Uh, like I said, the, the, the youth part of it, I really like. And I said, well, what can we do? What's next? And I did want to build an airplane. But I didn't want to be by myself in the basement. So that's, again, that's the genesis of it. And we got the commitment from people. So, so how hard was it? This is, you know, I know that you're, I've seen your bear hawk and I know that you're an engineer, an aeronautical engineer. And I know that the quality of that build is, your bear hog build is outstanding. And, and probably you, you, uh, you spent a lot of time with that. So how hard is it to, to step back from that role and, and, and let somebody else do that work for, for a guy, an engineering minded guy. like <laughs> Not, not too bad. Um, the, the, uh, the RV 12 is actually really easy to build. It's all metal. So it, it, it doesn't take an awful lot of craftsmanship. It takes a lot of assembly experience. So um, it, 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 you never saw something go bad there. The fiberglassing is not top notch, but that's okay. It, 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 just, it, it just wasn't worth the extra time and effort to make it absolutely perfect. And so I was just more interested in it going together right and kids and adults learning it. And that was, that was fine with me. Very good. Well, that was excellent. Um, now you say, you, so some of these other places have taken on, uh, uh, are starting to do some of this same kind of thing. Yeah, so there's a place in Bridgeport, you know, well, before I did it, you know, it wasn't my idea to do an RV-12. I think there have been about a dozen of them around the country. And I did call and talk to some of them and ask them how they, how they were doing it. And basically, you know, everything you saw here, logistics explaining, I asked them how they did it. And, um, and, and then I think I, we were the first ones in the New England area. And now there are two more, yeah. That's really great. What a what a what a great experience for those kids and uh, and I suspect for the mentors as well too. I'm sure it was all very good. Now, is this plane for sale? Are you planning on selling it? Or are you going to keep it in this club? No, it's in the club. That's that's it. That's its home. And it, it's a little it was a little equity flying club, right? Yeah. So everybody, the, the uh, we we did the math. And by far the simplest and cleanest and actually the most economical way to do it is to have people buy a share of the airplane and be an owner. And as an owner, you get certain privileges. You can take flight instruction in it and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And then if you want out, you have to sell it. You're responsible for selling your share. Um, <clears throat> and then we just divide uh, monthly expenses up and hourly expenses. And that's the way Silver City Flying Club at Meriden Airport since 1947 has operated successfully. And it's a good model. And so uh, that's the way we're doing it. And it, it Somebody asked, "What was the final? Who was the final builder of ownership per the FAA?" That's a good question. Because it was an ELSA, um, the manufacturer is actually Vance, and you you can do that because if you say if you sign a document that says this airplane is built completely to the plans with no deviations, Vance will sign up to be the manufacturer of the aircraft. If it's an EAB aircraft the builder of the aircraft, the amateur build aircraft is the builder is the manufacturer. And so those are very important blocks to fill in correctly in the uh, application for uh, registration. So, and by being an ELSA, uh, it's only a five hour fly off because the thought is that you have a known engine propeller combination and it's built the plans. And so you should, you don't have to have a 40 hour fly off which is very advantageous. Very nice. And and then a question came up was so the club bought it from the chapter providing the seed money for the next build right. or uh, next build yeah um, nobody has stepped up to run that I'm I'm kind of strung out on other things right now <laughs> and so that, remember the commitment thing right you, nothing happens without commitment so um, 
we're going to, of course, the COVID thing has really slowed down everything this summer, right? So once we get back into normal operation, we're going to meet and decide if we're going to build another airplane or put that into some other project on the airport. There has been discussion about maybe having a chapter hangar at the airport uh, mm -hmm. where you could do things like that. Uh, that's a thought. Um, we just uh, just haven't made any decisions yet. Very good. Well, Mark, thank you so much for doing this this evening. We really appreciate it. Great job and uh, fascinating, fascinating story. And, and really what a great gift you gave those kids and, and those mentors, I'm sure, that, that were a part of it. So thank you very much. We look forward to seeing you here in Arkansas. Yeah, looking forward to coming down and flying on all those uh, grass trips. Thank yeah. everyone for me. I miss everybody. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Laura's misses all of her Connecticut family. <laughs> good i'll tell them <laughs> all right thanks again thanks everybody for being here uh next week remember uh drink green beer and and uh play with the uh, leprechauns and we'll see you the following <laughs> week uh hopefully with kevin quinn and uh then uh, we've got some other things lined up after that so stay tuned and have a good night everybody thanks okay thanks everybody